MIT started open courseware. That's putting lectures on the web so people could access them and not have to attend. They could actually get some idea, basically attend modules without registering and being there. Kind of all of age now, but it's not a modern idea at all. 2004, Facebook. Oh, I was at university at that time. I moved away from doing computer architectures for a while. So I was doing very much graphical stuff using uh, fancy graphics machines like SGIs and then later NVIDIA, etc. 2005, IBM sells its computing business to Lenovo. It gets into basically business consultancy, which is probably <coughs> what it does. YouTube comes about, 2006, Twitter, Sony PS3 comes out, relevant because it's a parallel processing machine. Um, original one, eight cell processors, I think it only used seven of them. Um, one because one might not work. Um, a powerful parallel processing machine. 2007, Amazon Kindle, iPhones, 2010, iPads, 2012, Raspberry Pis. Massive acceleration of the computer industry. Uh, the processing of yesterday, which seemed pretty good in the 1980s, completely overtaken by what's been happening. And why has it happened? It's happened because the density of transistors you can put on a chip has gone up. Today, that's a typical Intel processor, an i5. It's got multiple cores on it. So instead of doing one computation at a time, it's a formal parallel processor. It's got multiple computing cores, one, two, three, four on it. So if you write your program properly, it will get a close to four times speed up. You don't, but that would be the idea. Um, people have gone to multi-cores for two reasons now, slightly different to the past. You want greater speed, but actually you also want to reduce the power consumption whilst getting that. The problem with a processor is it uses a lot of power. Now, if you, say, take a chip, a processing chip in your PC, and you want to make it run faster, one way of doing that is to increase its clock speed. You have a little clock that ticks away. If you increase its speed, it will run faster or break. But to get around about a 20% increase in speed will cost you between 50 and 70% increase in power consumption. If it's... A machine on your desk, the problem there is it gets awfully hot and you have to have fans to cool it down and it becomes noisy. It also likely not last as long as well, it will become faulty. If it's a telephone or a tablet, its battery life goes down massively and you don't want that. Using multi-cores helps solve that because you actually make your cores run a little bit slower but you have four of them so you get more processing power. So you don't increase your power consumption or it's marginal increase in power consumption but you get a rapid increase in power. So in some areas parallel processing is there not just to increase power but also reduce power consumption. And that just gives you an idea of how that's the cash that's caused up there. And lots more processes are coming about. So, uh, I picked this one. Um, this is the processor from Exmos, a UK company. Exmos is kind of the company that came out of Inmos. It's been formed after Inmos by some of the same people. And they've concentrated on multi-core processors for embedded systems. And this one has got eight cores in it. And you can buy a development board for that for about £14. So they've also become amazingly cheap. The whole thing runs uh, about the same speed as our Raspberry Pi, I would guess. I've not benchmarked it yet. I said about transistors going up. There's a thing called Moore's Law, and he developed a theory that said around about every two years, the number of transistors will double. 
on a chip. And people have plotted what's happened, and that's near enough exactly what's happened. The number of transistors on the chip have gone up and up and up, doubling every two years. And it means where we started down here with 1,000, CIF IV2, around about 4,000, around about there, we now getting up to the 10 billion transistors. What we are seeing is a slight dip in performance of single cores. And that's basically because we can't drive these things much faster. The clock speeds are getting to a limit of the technology. Um, speed of light starts to come into this somewhere. So again, multi-cores gives us that extra boost of power. Um, and this just gives, I won't go into this particularly, but it gives integer performance on a single fence, on a single core. And you see that it went up rapidly and it's slowly going down. So it's gone down to 21% per year. So it's still going up, but it's not going up so rapidly. And a similar pattern for floating point performance. So you need these multi-cores if you're going to push up that performance value. Skip that. So that's where we are now. We've kind of, as life has evolved, we've had parallel processing. Well, we've had single processing using mechanical devices, using valves, using transistors. Then dipped into parallel processing for supercomputers. Dipped into parallel processing for small and microprocessors, transputers kind of got overtaken by single processors again, but now we're back into sort of parallel processing with multi-core chips and multi-processor chi uh, machines as well. Looking forward, there's some chance that we might move away from just evolution of processing. It's a thing called quantum computing. Quantum computing again goes back to quantum theory. And we're used to in computers talking about the state of something. It's either a naught or a one. Quantum computing is based on quantum theory, and it says actually, in the right conditions, a qubit, a quantum bit, can be simultaneously in a naught or one state. So you can't talk about it being a naught or one, it could be any of those. And then you can start those together. And it's, it's basically an electron itself. But the idea is, until you measure its state, it's not determined. One interpretation of this is, when we set something like this up, it's in all these intermediate states. Or you could say it's in all of them simultaneously. And each one corresponds to a different possible universe. And when you look at it, you pick a universe to be in. That's one interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it's absolutely bizarre. But it seems to work. And a company called D-Wave have made a machine based on qubits and quantum fee, or so they claim. And they've sold some of these machines. Google uses it and NASA uses it. And it seems to work, and it gives amazingly fast computation for certain types of problems. And they're what usually called search problems or relaxation problems. Um, they're no good for adding numbers up. You would never, you get no advantage for that at all. But if you wanted to find a solution to a really complex set of differential equations, these might be the things to use. But as I say, they do seem to work fast, but nobody's quite sure outside the company how they work, because they won't actually, they've been very careful not to release the technology behind it. But as I say, it's thought to work on quantum theory. So where we've had more parallel processing before, this could be multiverse processing. Using lots of different universes to do your processing and then selecting the result that is optimal. That's one interpretation. Other things happening, I mentioned microcontrollers, which didn't do that. We're getting a host of little boards, um, like this. Little processing boards. Um, they've got ARM chips on them, 
This one's got a display on it. I started it, it's got Pac-Man on it. Um, quite powerful little boards, about a quarter of a pound of Raspberry Pi. That board set you back £20. So you've got a mass of computing power for £20. Um, I would say it's about 10,000 10, times faster floating point operations than a BBC Micro. So they're very powerful systems. It gives the opportunity to think about making your own parallel processing machines. Time lots of those together and get really economical processing. And the wonderful thing about them is they're very low power usage because they're made for embedded systems. And there are lots of them, different makes, um, using similar technologies. The ARM processor in all the ones I've shown there is used, or the ARM architecture. And then the manufacturers put that into their own chip, and you've got an ARM chip running these systems. So plentiful supply of processing, very cheap. Graphics cards. I carefully didn't say much about graphics um, because, again, it would take hours to talk about that. But graphics cards started live to help you draw nice little triangles and lines on the screen. So then started putting fancy shading, then textures, and increased the speed from a few triangles per frame to millions of triangles per frame. Um, they did that through parallel processing at a small scale. Um, more recently, companies like NVIDIA and AMD have realised the little processing elements that are used for doing graphics, with a little change, could be made into true processing cores. An example of this is CUDA cores, or the CUDA system from NVIDIA. And each one of these little dots is a processor. And you can set them problems to do. And you, for £800, you can buy a Kepler card from NVIDIA and it will have round about um, 1,500 processors on it. So you're into teraflop type processing. Um, so CPU, a few cores, GPU, thousands of cores basically. And a real increase in processing. They, they're claiming what? 3,000 odd gigaflops, which is 3 teraflop performance. Tablets get faster. Um, if I can just find my tablet. Right, a typical tablet. Just to show how ridiculous it's all getting. Right, one tablet. This one is like that, it's a Tegra 4 processor. We've had our BBC Micro doing its Mandelbrot. It's got that far. Right, Whoa, let's just put this back to the beginning. Right, I don't know if you can see this, but that's the speed a tablet can compute Mandelbrots. There's the Mandelbrot, that's what that will eventually become. And don't press the button. Zoom in at that rate. It's doing the same job. Actually, this is doing a lot more. Um, to do the Mandelbrot, you have to do a number of iterations per pixel. That's using, I think I set it as 30 or 40. This is using 1,000 iterations. So 25 times more, and we can instantaneously zoom in to the detail. This runs at about um, 500 to 600 megaflops on a tablet. That's kind of 10 cray ones working together back from the 70s. Tablet will cost you between 100 and 200 pounds for this type of tablet. A cray one would have cost you many millions of dollars. This massively outperforms it. So, we've gone through this massive leap in technology. It will start to slow down if we don't go more towards parallel processing. Because there is a limit to how many transistors you can actually get onto a chip. That's just about that. 
Xbox One came out recently, as did the PS4. Um, again, just to give a comparison, Xbox One has got eight cores in it, eight processor elements, um, five billion transistors on it. So, 4,600 5 billion transistors. Technology making it, when you made 6502s, the, the sort of distances you were working with were 0.5 micron technology. Um, that's 10 to the minus 6 of a meter. Nowadays, when we're working with Xbox, we're using 28 nanometer technology. That's nanometers 10 to the minus 9. Now, to get an idea of this, an atom's diameter is approximately somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 of a nanometer. So, if we keep on making these things smaller, we're going to actually get, we can't. We're going to get to the size of an atom, and you need a few atoms strung together to make a transistor. So, there is a physical limit now coming with this technology. It's a little way off, but it will come. Oh, as I mentioned before, my interest at the moment is basically tying things together in a parallel processing way. Think of fault tolerance so that if a few of them fail, the system carries on working. Uh, there are some great new things about it at the moment. You can build your own processors. You can get things called FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. They've got lots of little gates, like your logic gates, that you can string together using uh, a program and build your own circuits. So, you know, lots of people have gone away and done things like, oh, we're interested in retro computing, let's build a 6502 processor at home. And you can do that using gate arrays. You've got ones coming out now with dual core arm on them and lots of gates so you can put your own communications together and put together your own chip for doing parallel processing. So that's kind of what I've been looking at. And they're so popular, you, I just noticed this on Kickstarter the other day, you, a company's about to uh, get funded, well actually it's got enough money to be funded, to build an FPGA that plugs into a Raspberry Pi so you can do chip design that adds on to a Raspberry Pi for the sake of, I think, a board costs about $80. Anyway, that's what that was supposed to look like. If we gave it a few more hours, it would look like that. You've seen it's much quicker to do it, um, basically, on modern technology. Computing has evolved massively. What has been a bit difficult at times is to keep up with it to use that processing power effectively. And, of course, there is that sort of golden rule um, I always applied to Microsoft. Microsoft operating systems will expand to fill the processing power required. So it still seems to take quite a while for Windows to boot up, even though my processors are that much more powerful. I'll stop there. I've run over. I apologise for that. So there's a whistle stop tour of where it's come from. Um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in it from really, I suppose, mid 70s and seeing this evolution of microprocessors throughout the whole range. And it, it's amazing just putting this together to look back. I seem to remember things like BBCs not being that slow, is the weird thing. They, they seemed quite powerful to me at the time. And now I realise I'm amazed we ever got anything done. A lot of the work I did at Aerospace on graphics displays, I prototyped on BBC machines just to see if the algorithms worked. And we just left them on overnight and came back next morning and if you were lucky you had done what you wanted. And now you've just got more processing power for most applications than you could ever use. Um, so that gives you an idea of where we've come from, where we're going. As I say, my interest now is back to parallel processing, how we tie these things together, but with the emphasis on it should carry on working when bits of it break. And also with extensibility, that is, don't just use the same processor. Processors go out of date, you should be able to add any processor into your array and it carry on giving you more processing power, rather than chucking it out. Thank you.
anyone have any questions? Just what the bell will be in 100 years time, and we like to predict where we will be in oh. <laughs> 2014. Um, not really. I, I think it will get faster. At least, I think for the next 10 years, we'll see distinct increases in processing power. Um, obviously, for some areas that's needed, it's so easy to absorb processing power if you're doing weather forecasting, engineering, or whatever. You, any increase you can use. For everyday use, I, I'm a bit sceptical. If I take the tablet I showed you earlier, the Tegra 4, it's actually far more powerful than you really need for most things. It's wonderful for playing games, and it's, you know, uh, you can put a game on there and get lovely reflections on the puddles like you would on, certainly on a PS3. It's vaguely around the same power as that. But do I really need any more processing than that? Um, the main use now is to try to make the machines more usable. So we're not calculating more. You know, we don't need it for running our spreadsheet. But if it's a better user experience, we've got a lot of processing power to help with that. But do we need... And then a hundredfold <coughs> increase in speed on that, I'm not convinced. What we need is better ideas of how to use that processing power and better algorithms. So the last few years, you've seen a massive increase in the ability to process visual information. So you can basically look through the camera and it'll track your eyes, it'll track your mouth. There's a program that was mentioned on the Gadget Show last night that will detect whether you're smiling or not. Um, which is quite useful for building up that interaction with the machine. We can do that now if we're clever enough with the algorithms. So it will increase, but it may not have that much effect in terms of raw processing power. But there is a limit, and we will reach that limit in the next few years of being able to do it in the same way we've done it in the past. But time processes together. Yeah, we can get more speed that way. It just gets a bit harder to make it work efficiently. A hundred years' time, I have no idea. I think quantum computing will be there. But that one, what difference that will make to everyday life, I have no idea. Better weather forecasting, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doug, at the moment, was your electrical and physical atoms to do all this kind of stuff, when do you think we'll reach the point where we need to look a completely different way of using that? For example, the human brain doesn't use diodes, chips and things. No, I was lucky enough to do some work on what's called neural networks, um, probably around about 20 years ago. Um, it doesn't. Um, it's wetware, as it's called. Um, it's the brain is really an analogue computer, not a digital computer. In terms of its low-level technology, it's not that sophisticated. It's the way it's connected together and the level of connectivity it's got. And we are nowhere near that at the moment. And we simulate it. We simulate simple, relatively simple neural networks on digital computers. But you're right, there is one direction which is try to build these things. But they won't be suitable as adding machines. We're not good adding machines. Um, but the complexity may give a more interesting behaviour for heuristics.